Of all the jobs you can do with your language skills, conference interpreting has got to be the hardest. In the throes of a great transition in humankind's affairs. Conference interpreting requires nerves of steel and a serious work ethic. You've got to juggle multiple languages in real time in front of some very important people. And when you see exactly how conference interpreting works, you are going to ask, surely they must be superhuman. I'm going to start you off easy here. Imagine you are a politician in an important meeting with a bunch of people speaking seven different languages. Now, most likely you cannot understand each other. So how do you bridge this linguistic gap in an important meeting? Well, you could have an English only rule where everyone has to speak English, but that's not exactly fair or even possible. And so this is where a professional interpreter comes in. Think of this person as a middleman. Interpreters are constantly switching from one topic to another, to another, to another. And they're working with experts in that field, right? And so the challenge becomes, how do I take that important information that that person has and I render that so that it can be understood by an expert in the other language? But make no mistake, my friends, there is a lot more to this than just being able to speak the language. Interpreting is an art form. You listen to a message in one language and convey that same message in another language as it's happening with no pauses and mistakes. Well, you can forget about mistakes. So let's set the scene. Who hires interpreters? Where does all this stuff go down? Well, interpreting happens at multilingual conferences that are usually very, very important. For example, meetings between representatives of national governments, international organizations, NGOs, medical conferences, things like that. As an interpreter, you are just up there interpreting real serious information. Sound daunting? Well, I spoke to three conference interpreters to find out exactly how it all goes down. This is Barry, this is Martin, and this is Andrea, one of Martin's students. They will be opening the kimono on this crazy world of conference interpreting, and later in the video, giving you some tips on how you can do what they do. So I want to get inside the mind of someone who chooses this particular career. Is there a particular personality type that's perfect for this job? It doesn't matter whether you are extrovert or introvert, you can do your job properly. If you sit in, in the booth, interpreting booth, nobody sees you anyway. So, I mean, you don't have to go out and chat with people. You just do your job and go home. I think in general, I would say that the interpreters that tend to be the most successful in this profession are interpreters that are very empathetic. They, they understand and are able to relate to other people, their, their ideas, their emotions. That's a big part of it, at least in, in my experience. I and mean, I've been at this for almost 30 years now. And then I would say intellectually, the best interpreters are curious. They're always asking why, and they're trying to figure out, okay, what's this about? Definitely some different feelings there. Do you have to be a native speaker of the language? Let me put it in these terms, right? You're a native English speaker. I'm a native English speaker. One of the first things that people who are looking for interpreters ask is like, are you a native speaker? And my question is, yes, of what language, right? And they're immediately thinking, well, native speaker of the language, I don't understand because I don't understand it. So you better be a native speaker because somehow that would make you a good interpreter in their mind. But that's not necessarily the case, right? And I think it's important to understand if you want to be an interpreter, you've got to be proficient in your languages. Your mother tongue needs to be exceptionally good. You really need to understand the grammar of your own mother tongue. But in addition to that, you also need to have those appropriate professional levels of proficiency in the other acquired languages. You need to be able to speak almost at a near native level when it comes to word choice, grammar, syntax, style. So it's all about motivation and curiosity then. These are the most important elements. You should also love to read and be amazingly passionate about language. What about you? Are you a grammar geek or does the very thought of grammar shut your brain down? And what if you have an accent? Frankly, an accent for me is not a showstopper at all if I can understand you. What you need to have is unobtrusive accents in your languages. And that can be in your native language as well, right? There are some accents that can be extremely difficult for certain 
speakers of that language to understand. Interpreters also do a lot of code switching, meaning that you switch between languages, phrases or words, even in the middle of a sentence. Es que se me olvidó llegar a la marqueta, so I have to go back now. But how well you can speak is just the start. You are tested for things like concentration and decision making under stress. So if you are resilient, well that's a good start. Not to mention self-awareness. Do you know what makes you tick? And by the way, did you know that there are also different types of interpreting? And they are quite different from one another. If you know any different types of interpreting, let me know in the comments. Otherwise, keep watching because we'll get to that a little bit later. You know, if I want to be a concert pianist, there's a sine qua non, there's, a, there, there's, a, there's just a must have. And that is, I got to have all 10 phalanges, right? It's kind of the same thing with languages, right? If I want to be an interpreter, I've got to have solid languages, right? They don't have to be, you know, all three native languages. There are people that due to circumstance, grow up speaking two or three languages. So they've got, you know, in that sense, they've got the 10 fingers to be able to look at, at doing uh, interpreting as a profession. But that's just, the, that's just the baseline. The earlier on that someone can realize that this is something that they want to do, the better. Because they need to have those languages and it takes time and effort to really put them in place so that you can be successful in this profession because it's demanding. So besides a solid mother tongue and excellent understanding of at least two or three other languages, interpreters also need to have many other skills and qualities. For one, you need great communication skills. A good speaker can analyze a message quickly, put their ideas in logical order and then articulate them very well. And as an interpreter, you have to remember that these are not your ideas. They're not your opinions, your, your opinions messages and emotions are completely irrelevant, which must be an interesting intellectual challenge to navigate in your job. So what can you do? Well, the trick is to think like an actor. An actor is only pretending to be the character, and especially on a stage with a live audience, you have to think about the reactions that you are getting constantly. It takes talent, but it also takes a hell of a lot of training. And then there is this. Imagine a meeting between Japanese and American delegates. There are big cultural differences here. Different cultures think in different ways, even in business. And so your mission goes beyond accurate translation of just the words. You have to also make sure that the listeners really get the message behind what they are saying. They must get it intellectually and they must get it intuitively as well. It's all on you. And this is where the real skill of interpreting comes in. It's really hard, but how do you practice understanding another culture? What did I do when I was acquiring Russian all the way back? I lived with a host family. They're like, oh, we've got to go pay the electric bill. I'm like, I'll do it. Why? I wanted to see how Russians paid for their electricity. And so I was able to look and I would look at the bill and I'd be studying the bill as I was waiting in line. I'm like, oh, look at that word. What? Oh, that's interesting. And then I would get up and I would do my very best and try to pay for the bill. And sometimes they'd be nice. And some are like, what is this foreigner doing paying an electric bill? Right. But you would learn. And so those are the things you have to do, right? You've really got to immerse yourself in the language and the culture. And I can see immediately the students that really do that. Immersion. Yes, immersion. Well, it's my favorite thing. But there is another thing here to think about. In English, the word order of a sentence goes subject, verb, object. So the men fled the scene. But what if the second language word order is completely different? Well, in a language like, say, Japanese or German, the verb, which is the doing word, doesn't come till the end of the sentence, which means unlike English, you don't actually know exactly what's being done in the sentence until right at the end of it's actually happened. You've got to wait a long time to get there. But the problem is, that you've got to be interpreting in real time as you go. Do you see the challenge there? So how on earth do you accurately interpret word for word on the spot? Well, the short answer is you obviously don't interpret word for word. You need to be able to concentrate on the message, the message behind what's being said, not the syntax. Prepare to have your mind blown. So, one of the best things about stories are the characters. They really get attached to the character, what they're going to do, why they do what they do, and how they do what they do. Yes, that's right. They are talking at the same time. It is called simultaneous interpreting. It's a simple magic trick. You listen to a message in one language and repeat it in another language while still listening for the next sentence in the first language. Piece of cake. And then there's this. 
Oh, hey there, bud. You want to grab a brewski and we can go watch the hockey game? Yeah? G'day, guys. I'm going to go to my mom's to grab an Arvo tea. The very first thing that the listener notices is the voice of the interpreter. No matter how genius you're translating, this first impression of your voice counts a lot. How are you going to play against Paris tomorrow? Very erotic voice, by the way, the translator. <laughs> But a sultry voice on its own isn't enough. They must believe you to the extent that you become invisible. Your job is to make communication so smooth that delegates completely forget that they are listening to interpretation. And that's where you nail it. And I, might I add that you do not need to have a standard pronunciation for this job at all, like a standard English pronunciation, not at all. The listener only wants to hear something that's easy on the ear and something that's believable because you are about to become the bridge that they meet on. Okay, so obviously this is all about talent, right? I mean, who could possibly do all of this without talent? I think that motivation is one of the most important factors because, um, and I, I've been translating a book uh, by Steven Pinker now when he's talking about nature or nurture, rationality, nature, nurture, or whether they, it's talent or, or practice. And basically, obviously talent talent helps but you have to practice and even if you have let's say average student who practices a lot they can actually become good interpreters N not so to say brilliant but good interpreters like solid interpreters so it's all about practice and some people need more practice okay so you are the right fit what now? What are some things that interpreters do on their own to prepare for this job? And one of the most important thing, I believe, for simultaneous interpreting is the thing we would call knowledge base. And this knowledge base is linguistic and extra-linguistic. So if, if you want to become in, uh, an interpreter, you have to read newspapers. You have to be interested in everything. You hate football? Never mind, you will watch football matches. You hate hockey? You will watch hockey matches because you never know what the people will refer to as you interpret. So we would have all sorts of exercises. For example, you would have like simultaneous paraphrasing. It means that I read a text in English and they're supposed to repeat the same text, but using different words. So they have to convey the same idea in the same language, but use different words. So they have to work with the text and word in their head before they start speaking. I would ask them to uh, name five animals, uh, but in different languages. So, and uh, we do this, this rapidly. So I say animals, they have to name five animals in the Slovak language. Then I say uh, veg vegetables in Slovak language, in this case, uh, uh, zelenina, and they have to name them in English language. And this causes a lot of time pressure and they have to react quickly under, under, under pressure. And this is one of the things how we're trying to prepare their brain. Or for example, I start the sentence in uh, in English and they are supposed to finish it in Slovak. Then I start the sentence in Slovak, they're supposed to finish it in English. And then you have, for example, yes, no, and why questions. Why questions are quite interesting is that you ask them a simple question like, why do you cut your grass, for example? And they have to reply in a full sentence, for example, to find a reason. And while they answer your question, you give them another question. So they have to listen to another question while finishing the answer of the previous one. And you have like, for example, 50 questions and they have to react quickly, always finishing sentence, listening to another question, then finishing that sentence. And, and this is the thing when, uh, they get really tired after, let's say, two hours of exercises. They get really, really cognitively tired. And if they're tired, I'm always happy because I said, yes, yes, you work with your brain. Your brain is happy. Next time, it's going to be much easier and much better. That is crazy. And you also have to sound confident about the topic. So in preparation, there's actually a lot of detective work to do. I don't know if this is a, a thing that Slovaks do or, or what it is, but quite often the people who are organizing the event prepare the materials like right in the last second, let's say. Yeah, so you don't really get that much time to prepare, but you know, it consists of a lot of reading. So when it's, it's usually two of us, so we cooperate on creating the glossary, then, you know, I wouldn't say I really study the glossary to the point where I remember all the terms. I mean, like if there's something that is really unknown, I'll have it printed out in front of me, highlighted, whatever. So trying to look up the some any kind of materials related to the topic i mean ideally the client gives you something to to start with and if not then you just 
look at uh, kind of related stuff on, you know, on the internet. So there's plenty of stuff on the internet. You can also, if you know who the speaker is going to be and if they're a big name, if they have any videos on the internet, you can get used to the the speaker as well. So that's quite important. I think. So you do as much prior research as you can. Try to understand the topic well so that you'll sound like you know what you're talking about. But nevertheless, the interpreters need to know what the topic is for the meeting. Preferably, they're going to be receiving several days, sometimes it's several hours, but several days in advance, some preparation material. It could be just a website of the company that they're going to be representing or whatever that may be. It could be a PowerPoint presentation. It could be a speech or it could be some documents on a topic that have been floating on the internet for years, but they need that material so that they can then prepare adequately hopefully in both languages. If not, we can do that research. And terminology enters into it, but everybody thinks it's just that, right? It's like, okay, you're word replacing robots, right? You got the dictionary, so what's the problem? Well, there's a lot more to it than just that. You have to be able to understand those concepts. In fact, if someone hands me a glossary or a document explaining about a process or a product or something that I'm going to be interpreting, I'll take the document about the product or the process over the vocabulary because I can look up vocabulary, I can establish that, but I wanna know what's going on because one of the basic things that I've taught my, my students well, for, for over 15 years is you cannot interpret what you do not understand. You know what it's like if you're listening in your own mother tongue and you don't have a clue about what they're talking about. It's just like words, 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 words. And if you were to ask someone, what did they just talk about? They said, I don't know. And if you think about it, okay, I listen. Okay, I understand the concept. Because what interpreters, truly professional, simultaneous interpreters, and consecutive interpreters too, are doing, is they are processing first and foremost for meaning. They have to understand the meaning. And then, you know, the words are just a vehicle for the meaning and the idea. And they'll take that and then they're going to look at it and they're going to understand the meaning. And then they're going to express what they've understood in the target language. Now, that's a lot different from just like, okay, I've heard five words, you know, it's like, and I'm just going to just parrot that into the other language, which can happen particularly in, you know, the romance languages or any language that has a shared lexicon or at least shared roots, right? So Spanish, French, Portuguese, Italian, English, you know, you've got the faux amis, you've got the, the false friends that people will just start spitting out and they'll think about it. And they'll say, well, yeah, that must be the same word. And like, well, what did that mean? And like, I don't know, but I got the words right. And of course, what is not being said can be equally important. For me, it was just fascinating when you would have someone who would say something and it's ambiguous. And yet, you know that they're specifically referring to something, but not being said. And everybody in the room that's listening to them in the original gets it. Now, as an interpreter, you have to get it as well, but you can't make the implicit explicit. You have to take that understands that oh, I know what he's talking about, but he's being really vague. So I've got to be equally vague when I put it into the other language. Otherwise, that could be misconstrued or I could get into trouble. Well, we wouldn't want that. This is high stakes business. And by the way, when it comes to really understanding what's being said in a language, that little word context is key. And this isn't just important for the professionals. If you are learning a new language, you're also going to learn a lot faster if you're surrounding yourself with context, not just blindly memorizing words and studying grammar rules like so many people do. And that's why I teach languages through stories. I call this method story learning. And the method is a little bit like a code, really, where I give you a simple story in the language that you're learning, and I show you how to crack the code of the story. It's a bit like learning in reverse, except that it's a very natural way of learning, which is fun and very different from all that memorizing, rote memorizing that you remember from school. Anyway, if you'd like to learn more about how to learn a language with stories, I have something for you which is completely free. Uh, it's called a, my, a, my, my story learning 
kit, and you can find the link in the description. The Story Learning Kit, my Story Learning Kit, is a collection of video masterclasses, audio guides, uh, printable worksheets, and it will show you step-by-step -step how the story learning method works so that you can decide if it's a method that you might like to use to learn a new language or to improve one uh, that you are already learning. Anyway, it's completely free. You can find the link in the description below. So what kind of topics do you typically get, Andrea? Right when I started interpreting, there was one crazy season where I was doing, it was nature protection on Monday, banking on Tuesday, Wednesday, we had a pharmaceutical conference and whatever, you know, and they were completely unrelated topics. And that was crazy. So I have a lot of different topics, but they all kind of repeat. So it's the same people, or if it's not the same people, at least it's the same topic, even if there's more of them. And that is possible. A two-day conference on... I believe it was like fascism in Europe and there was a lot of history involved in that and they gave us a lot of time to prepare for that so it was doable but it was definitely more challenging than the topics I usually do right. Makes me wonder what topics I would prefer I, I really have no idea although there are certainly some topics I would prefer to avoid. Do you always have to wear a headset? It's I have done one interpreting session without a headset. That was just not possible because what is happening is you are listening and speaking at the same time. So you really need that sound directly in your ears. Otherwise, you are interrupting yourself. You cannot hear the speaker over your own words. It's also very useful to figure the speaker out as soon as possible. Try and get inside their mind. Who are they? What's their attitude and character like? Are they tolerant or impatient, amusing or arrogant? Okay, so we figured out that interpreting is not just a matter of reproducing words super fast. It involves a mastery of languages and it's an exceptional ability. Let's go deeper. Martin, are there any specific cognitive strategies that an interpreter can work on to develop their ability? One of them for me, uh, and probably I would say the most suitable, the, the one I like the most would be anticipation, which means that you start and you anticipate how the sentence is going to finish. And you can do this based on two strategies. You can do it either linguistically or from the context, contextually. So you anticipate what your speaking, a speaker is going to talk about based on, based on his uh, profession, for example, or country of origin. So basically it's more or less about um, uh, being able to identify stereotypes to, to be able to anticipate from the context. And then there's linguistic anticipation. So for example, uh, if, you, uh, if you're talking to your uh, seven years old son, for example, and you ask him during the week, where did you go today? He will tell you, I went to school. So you can anticipate what he's, go what, what he's going to say. So basically you have linguistic and contextual anticipation. So this is for me, one of the, one of the best strategies. Then the, uh, there's also the strategy that at least in Slovakia, we call something like bridging. It means that you speak simultaneously with the speaker, then you omit sentence and you connect the next sentence with the previous one without uh, people noticing that you omitted the sentence. So this would be, uh, for example, a risky, risky strategy. I, I would say it's a high risk strategy, but still it makes you sound fluent. Generalization, for example, is also quite helpful. But again, I would say it's a high risk strategy because, for example, you hear numbers like uh, 993 and you say almost 1000, for example, which can be used somehow, uh, some, sometimes, uh, but it's also very dangerous if those numbers are quite uh, important. And another thing is, for example, splitting your attention so you have to do two things at once and we can train this also with our students for example i read one text in in the slovak language they read simultaneously with me completely different text in english language and then i ask them what did i read about and now you tell me what did you read about so they have to be able to listen and concentrate on two things and remember what about speed versus accuracy is there a bit of a trade off there there's another thing i mean there is lexical complexity another important input variable or accent for example um, and for for example you can interpret to 120 word per minute speaker which which sounds great there is no terminology sounds great but he has for example a thick french accent and, and he would say sickness of eyes and he's talking about 
thickness of ice. And you have to be able to recognize these specific features of the given language that are being transferred into English in order to be able to decipher the message. And when you have all those factors, all those input variables combined, so for example, if the speaker is fast uh, with a um, difficult accent and using a lot of terminology, then it, is, it gets very difficult and you have to prepare that in advance. So you have, yes, there are a lot of trade-offs, you're right, but uh, you can never sacrifice the message, the main message that, mm -hmm. that the speaker is trying to convey. No wonder you all look like magicians. How long can you interpret for while still staying accurate? Two hours? This is very important point you made. You never interpret for two hours. <laughs> because usually when you do simultaneous interpreting, there are two of you in the booth and you have to take turns after 20 minutes. So it's been measured that you can concentrate, focus on, on interpreting for 20 minutes, then you have to relax a little bit, your colleague interprets for 20 minutes, and then you go again. If uh, those of you who are listening to this video uh, think of interpreting, never do that yourself. Never go into booth by, on your own, never. Even if they tell you it's going to be easy, just two hours and a piece of cake, no. Two hours, two interpreters, always. Okay, I was dead wrong. Same rule if you're interpreting on Zoom, by the way, so don't let that fool you. But I'm curious what happens during really heated debates, because speakers must sometimes get quite worked up about issues. How do you handle that? Are you expected to match their emotion? This is a separate field of research in interpreting, actually, yeah. because uh, voice quality and intonation uh, seems to be also quite important uh, factors in um, in the perception of interpreting. So I don't think that it has been proved uh, scientifically that if your intonation is neutral or so to say boring, monotonous, people switch off and don't listen to you. You don't want to be over emphatic, but you, your voice has to be lively when you interpret because imagine yourself, I mean, listening to interpreter. What kind of interpreter would you would you like to listen to? Because you sit at the conference for like eight hours and you have to listen to interpreters. So imagine listening to like monotonous voice for eight hours. I'm not sure how you would do that because you would switch off quite quickly. You know, it's, it's very difficult to listen to. So I wouldn't exaggerate the intonation, but it is very important factor. So they have to have this feeling you're not falling asleep while doing your work. Now, earlier I told you about different types of interpreting, and this is where it gets interesting. It's been a while since I've been here. I'm so excited to be back. Thank you for having me. Desde hace bastante tiempo que no venía, así que muchísimas gracias por recibirme nuevamente. So we've shown you what simultaneous interpreting looks like, but the one you just saw is a different kind. In interpreting, you've got really uh, three modes. You have consecutive, which is the person speaks then stops, then the interpreter interprets. It's kind of like that ping pong back and forth. Uh, people who are not trained normally will do it in small chunks. And you'll have someone who will start to say something like, buenos dias, and they'll say, good morning, right? Immediately, because they don't want to forget it. And it's like, it's going to fall out of my brain if I don't just spit it out immediately, because I know those words. And then you have trained interpreters who are trained in what we call long consecutive with notes where they are able to listen to a message, analyze it for meaning, use their own customized note-taking system to jot down those ideas, and then be able to give that back consecutively in chunks of anywhere from say two minutes to 10. But in reality, most of the time it's gonna be two to three minutes and it's a, it's a very advanced skill and one that is, almost appears superhuman when you see people do it. The definition of madness, I say. I'm curious what you think though. If you were an interpreter, which would you prefer to do, simultaneous or consecutive? Why? Let me know in the comments. Is there any other kind of interpreting? There can also be the whispering interpreting, which is sim simultaneous. Uh, that, that's quite demanding. I don't really like it because you are listening to the speaker and at the, the same time, you're kind of quietly interpreting it from a person sitting usually next to you. But this is quite, yeah, that one is quite demanding. It's like doing simultaneous, but without uh, headphones, which is awful. So when you're doing your prep work and looking up words related to the topic, how do you get that glossary of words into your head? Are there any tricks or methods to internalize it? 
yeah, if I have some time to prepare, so let's say at least a week, I'll try to put that, for example, into Anki and to review it maybe more often than Anki would naturally review it, right? If I don't have much time and it's like one or two days, you know, sometimes there's very last minute offers for interpreting. So if I don't have much time, it's a new topic, just trying to, rather than study the vocabulary kind of on its own, trying to study the context. And then if there are some words that stand out, I'll, you know, highlight them. I prefer highlighting in the text. And if I feel it necessary, then I'll put in a glossary, arrange it alphabetically and have it kind of there, so. Let's clarify the difference between translating and interpreting. Remember, everything we heard so far was just interpreting. We can say that translation is written in, and interpreting is verbal. So that would be the main difference. But, but then there are a lot of other, other differences. For example, uh, you can edit your translation, whereas you cannot edit your especially simultaneous interpreting. There are certain time constraints. So for example, if you look at decalage or ear, ear voice span, uh, as we call it, it's about two on, or four seconds before you start interpreting uh, you have so you have four seconds to prepare what you're trying to say whereas when translating you have more time and let's say more comfort when you when you work on your translation and you you have enough time to revise it edit it whereas in interpreting you have to do it uh, properly and that is why interpreting is more stressful there's no time to sleep on it or phone a friend it is clearly a job for adrenaline junkies it's very interesting though to have to move on. What's said is said. You can't, you have no say in this. You can't change it. You have to keep going. And translation is its own thing. So each part of the profession is quite different. We'll have to make another video comparing them all. There are different ways, but in terms of training, I would say to anybody who is really looking to get into this professionally, get trained, get the training. It isn't just a question of knowing the two languages. And there is so much that you need to understand in the different uh, settings where interpreters work, whether it be at a medical center or a courtroom or a, a diplomatic encounter or a product rollout for a Fortune 500 company, right? The rules adapt based on where you are and, and what's, what the expectations are. You need to learn those. You need to get trained about that. Now, as far as linguistic training is concerned, yes, you need to get that as well. For medical interpreting, there are many different programs. Some of them are certificate programs. There are programs where you can go on and get you know, a, a university degree and then you know, do even a, a, a master's in this. But you should look and say, okay, well, how much am I going to be able to make? What's it going to cost? Do the math. There are lots of offerings out there. If you are serious about going into diplomatic interpreting or conference interpreting, you really, really do need to have a university degree. And the standard has been for the last 30 years, you go on and you get a master's or you get a post you know, graduate degree where you get trained and those can run anywhere anywhere from one year to two years and you need that training because it is a very demanding profession and also for example if you were to go to someplace like the middlebury institute of international studies where i i taught for many years not only do you get the training but you also get a built-in network of people who have worked as staff interpreters for the United Nations, for the US State Department, for other um, uh, diplomatic services of other countries, right? Because there are students from all over the world that study there. And there's a lot that comes with that to help you really make it into that career and be successful. And you should also take a good look at what the demand is for the language combinations that you have, right? There are language combinations that are workhorse combinations, English, Spanish. Since we're in the United States, English, Spanish, English, uh, Portuguese, English, French, and English, Chinese, English, Korean, English, Japanese. But if let's say you speak, you know, I don't know, Bosnian, Serbian, Croatian, or, or Montenegrin, well, your market's probably going to be fairly reduced 
And it depends on what the other languages that you should learn. English is kind of a given, could be German. You need to understand the market where you're going to work and live so that you can see if that market is really going to allow you to stay, you know, work professionally and successfully. How did you train for this, Andrea? I became very interested in English when I was about 12, I would say. And yeah, all the way through high school, I started spending more and more time kind of living in English. So I was doing a lot of self-talk and whatever. So with this good, let's say solid foundation, I then went on to university and the first, let's say two, maybe even three years were more translation oriented. So I think it was actually in year two or possibly even year three that we actually started looking more into the interpreting aspect. The teacher would say, you know, make sure that you read the news and whatever, because you need to be kind of oriented in what's going on with the world. And he would then pick somebody and that person was just supposed to present recent events, let's say. And it was just to make us better at just expressing our ideas in our own language. So we started with Slovak, with our native language. And I believe, yeah, year three, I think we started looking at simultaneous interpreting so we would we started with shadowing and we did that for quite a while well some people swear by this method for practicing languages shadowing is where you listen to an audio in a foreign language and repeat what they're saying while they speak and then we got into paraphrasing so it was still in the same language but saying ideas in a different way which was quite challenging because i think it's actually more challenging than interpreting because you have to think about okay i cannot say it this way i have to say it another way you know whereas in slovak let's say between indo-european languages i think it's quite easy to just mirror what is being said in the other language but paraphrasing i found quite challenging and then we started with very simple texts going from slovak to english first actually it was english to slovak and yeah then we just kept you know, practicing, practicing, practicing. We were encouraged to do lots of shadowing, lots of paraphrasing, lots of basic interpreting at home as well. We would do recordings. So the teacher would record what we were saying and then we had to analyze it and say, okay, this is where I made a mistake. You know, I have a lot of hesitation uh, in this section and just something like the register is not quite right in this section or whatever. So we were, we would be analyzing our own uh, performances quite a lot. Did your teacher have any particular ways to make you suffer? So we had him running around with a drill and he was like making a lot of noise around us. So we would get used to stressful situations and stuff like that. A drill in your ears, that is pretty hardcore. How long does it take? So I believe that let's say in, in four semesters, in my opinion, you can prepare interpreters for their job if they want to do it, because motivation is a very important factor in, in, in this process. And what kind of outcomes do you get? Do they generally do well? In the best case scenario, they end up uh, working like machines, basically, uh, concentrated machines. I imagine that a person would benefit from some kind of vocal training. Do students have to get voice training? It's yeah. certainly it's not part of uh, training in Slovakia, and I'm not aware that it, it is a part anywhere in Europe. It might be. We started thinking about incorporating that into curricula, but it will it will take some time. And it is very important issue. It should be a part of curricula. I can't even imagine what your vocal cords must feel like. I would have a gallon of water on standby, or maybe something a little bit stronger. No, 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 no. <laughs> you drink no. I wouldn't. I wouldn't do that. I wouldn't even recommend doing that uh, a night before. Let's take a step outside of the conference center environment for a moment. What happens when the meeting is online? Well, good old technology is there to save the day yet again, or new technology, I guess. Zoom has an interpreting option now on some versions. I Welcome to all our offices around the world. I haven't tried it myself, but I believe you can even choose the accent that you want. Interesting. So technology has really changed the profession. Has that impacted you in your work, Martin? If I work, uh, say, for uh, Council of Europe, I would have to go to Strasbourg. And now I sit in Banska Bystrica in Slovakia in a remote uh, booth or uh, interpreting hub, and I click interpret, finish and go home for dinner, for example. So this is kind of more comfortable. 
in in some ways and and you, you save a lot of money you save a lot of time so from this point of view or this perspective it is it is beneficial i would say but on the other hand you're disembodied you're, you're just a voice so this would be negative and some people uh, need to meet other people to feel comfortable how does online interpreting change your preparation i would say the preparation is more or less the same because they send you materials they send you uh, agenda they send you some uh, presentations so this would be uh, quite similar uh, to what it was before now you have to prepare mainly for technical uh, problems and technical issues if you have for some reason bad weather for example and and you have a bad uh, quality of signal, you cannot predict that. I mean, you can get a great computer, you can have um, a great Wi-Fi uh, or internet in general, but there still might be some technical glitches. So this is, and, and based on research is, uh, that were conducted. So in Slovakia, interpreters usually say that this is uh, the most stressful factor about technology. Well, it certainly sounds stressful to me. You speak both languages, so what could possibly go wrong? Well, one of the challenges is when you're doing two meetings in a day, interpreting for completely different topics, sometimes with very little time to prepare. I am sensing sleepless nights in there somewhere. Another challenge is getting good audio. Usually, you can work it out of the context. You can say, oh, okay, he's probably talking about this. He's probably talking about that. And you say that, and in most cases, if, again, it's something that you've been interpreting for a while, there's a high chance that you'll get it right. If it turns out to be wrong, you just, you know, I just say, I apologize. We actually meant to say this. Yes. And, you know, you can admit your mistake. I think that's no, it's definitely better than trying to pretend you were right. Good audio is really, really important. So there's a reason that I always have a headset on and I use a boom microphone because it gives the best uh, sound and the best possibility for success in these meetings. There's a whole issue of also, if you get into sound and it's a, what's the frequency response of the microphone that you're using? What's the sampling rate? You know, all of those things become really important. We like really, really, really good sound. And it's getting better. And the platforms are working to improve on that, but we need anybody participating on an online meeting to think, how can I make sure that people are going to understand me? And that means I need to provide them with the best sound possible. And that may mean wearing a headset, but you'd be surprised how many people are just like, eh, I don't do headsets. But there are other kinds of difficulties too. When you're new at it, you might get stage fright and that's always awful. That sudden hyper awareness of yourself, knowing there's nothing you can do about it, but you have to keep going. And what about jokes? Say someone cracks a joke. Do you even attempt to translate it? The thing that you get taught is if somebody is going to say a joke, try to just tell another joke in the language that you know, something that works, whatever. So do most interpreters tend to stick with one dialect of the language that they're interpreting into? Not necessarily say so. I think it just depends on what your natural way of speaking would be. And then you find, I mean, maybe some people don't have this challenge. You know, maybe if somebody is interpreting somewhere in America for presumably American clients, they don't have to do this. So maybe it's something specific for Europe, where very often, you know, English is the channel, but quite often it's not the kind of native language. I couldn't define it. It's just more, it's rhotic English, you know, it's, it's not saying water, it's saying water. But the problems are not always going to be about you. It's more difficult, I would say, today because we have a lot of community interpreting, uh, even in Slovakia now. And community interpreting is thing you uh, usually do with um, refugees, for example, and a lot of foreigners who are um, really struggling. And nowadays we do have a serious situation with our Ukrainian friends coming to Slovakia a lot. And when you have to interpret those stories and you're trying to assist them, for example, at offices, social security, police, foreign police, it's, it's a bit challenging because you're not a machine. And this is what a lot of people think that interpreters are machines, basically like linguistic machines. You sit in your booth, listen, and you interpret. And if you interpret really difficult uh, stories and difficult situation and, and tra tragedies, basically, um, it moves you a lot. Okay, so in this case, it's less linguistically difficult and more emotionally and psychologically difficult. Makes sense. You're dealing with traumatized people and that must be really hard, helping people find their new place in society. 
we had one very embarrassing moment when we were interpreting this it was like the celebrations or the anniversary of the Slovak national uprising where basically the Slovak national uprising had obviously massive support from the Russians and not just the Russians but other Soviet nations as well and the speaker mentioned somebody where we had terrible sound we had huge sound issues that day and he mentioned something that was like and you know Romanians our enemies and that's how we interpreted it and then we looked at each other and my colleague were like they were definitely on our side you know so I was like we are terribly sorry we meant to say our dear friends you know <laughs> yeah I think we have enough war going on don't you don't want to be adding to that. Now, what is your all time favorite job as an interpreter? My favorite types of interpreting, you know, the other day I was doing this meeting where things got quite heated uh, between the two sides. And in the end, one of the my client messaged me and he was like, I'm really sorry that that happened, that there was so much tension. And I was like, I loved it. You know, that's what I enjoy. It's the passion. I, I love interpreting anything that has to do with some, anything that's some kind of a marketing event because there's so many emotions involved in that from the speaker. I, I think you do a good job if you can transfer those emotions onto the audience. So if things get heated, that's actually something that I really enjoy, so. So you try to match that energy, in other words. Yes, right. definitely. <laughs> what about some of the most enjoyable aspects? Everything, I mean, it's, it's, it's wonderful. It's wonderful profession. It's, it's not stereotypical. So you interpret a lot of different um, conferences, for example, you learn a lot, you have to learn a lot, you have to stay vigilant, you have to read a lot. Uh, so basically, you're always trying to broaden your uh, knowledge base, you meet a lot of interesting people, you see different parts of the world, you meet important people, which you would not be able to meet if you didn't interpret for them, for example, like uh, speakers of the parliament, prime ministers, presidents. Uh, so this is quite interesting. For example, you see the different sides of, uh, of the world and you, you realize that important people are just people. For example, uh, in general, I would say that it's, it's well paid, it, it, it's, it's well paid profession and uh, it's very dynamic. But you have to be that type of personality who likes dynamic jobs and dynamic activities. And I believe that this is uh, very, very dynamic and very interesting job. Uh, I would recommend it to, to everyone. For me, it's when you see that you have helped facilitate a connection that is positive, right? Or you have helped, in the case of court interpreters, seeing justice served, making sure that people get their day in court and that they have, you know, that their rights are respected. Um, there, there's so much that goes into this to be able to help. And I would add one other thing that I have often found uh, among interpreters. And that is a deep sense of justice and wanting things to be fair. Really, I mean, if you talk to most interpreters, they, they get in, they, they want to make sure that, you know, people are treated fairly. You got to put in the legwork. You got to do the study. and. I would recommend spending at least a year abroad in a language in the country that speaks the language that you're working to acquire and live in the language, write in the language, think in the language. I would first, I guess, look at the universities in my surroundings <laughs> to check uh, for interpreting programs because you can have uh, master programs in interpreting that would be in Slovakia at least uh, two years and I believe the two years are sufficient to to master a uh, basic strategy of interpreting and then uh, I would read a lot uh, I would probably do my best to listen to other interpreters. For example, European Parliament provides a web page where all, um, all speeches uh, are recorded and interpreted into all European um, Union languages. So you can listen to your colleagues, see what you like, what you don't like, because often interpreters, at least those who start, have a lot of hesitating sounds like fillers, you know, basically. So you have to work with that. You have to work on your fluency. You have to talk a lot, for example. Good exercises, if you're thinking about becoming interpreter would be listening to, to some broadcasts or listening to some news and repeating everything they say that's called shadowing and after you finish try to 
remember what you just repeated. So this is the way how you can find out whether you're into it or not. But certainly I would I would sign up for some uh, courses on interpreting. There's uh, certainly a lot of them. That's right. It is very important to get proper training for interpreting because you can make serious mistakes. For example, if you're interpreting about war at a UN conference, you just can't afford to get things wrong. The rule is reveal the message, don't alter the message. In the US, there is a place you can go in Monterey for training. And you heard what Barry said, it is a very well-paid job. Not that you were asking, of course. Now, any words of wisdom or encouragement for the people watching? With this job, you will really get to know a lot about, or maybe a little bit about a lot of things, let's say. So you are never the expert in the room in terms of the topic that is being talked about. But th maybe that's the beauty of it. You are not so involved, so you don't have to worry about not solving the world hunger crisis and whatever, you know, because you are just the person trying to facilitate that communication, but you get to see a little bit of everything. So in terms of the variety of knowledge that you'll get from this, it's fantastic. Uh, in terms of the people you'll see, it's fantastic. It's, as we said, it's the, the wage is really good. The, um, it's really interesting. You get to travel a lot. And yeah, it's, I love this job. I would just like to encourage all of you who are uh, considering becoming interpreters because it's fun, it's great, it's adrenaline, and the reward you have is this beautiful feeling of satisfaction if everything was worked properly. So I would certainly go for that because I, I think at least for me, it's, it's one of the best professions in the world. But of course, conference interpreting is not the only job around for people with language skills. You might also try getting into the diplomatic service, for example. And this video shows you exactly how American diplomats go about training themselves to learn new languages and negotiating all that rather tricky stuff that goes on around the world. You're really gonna like this.